Good morning. How are you guys doing? Good, good, good. All right, well, let's have one more word of prayer, and then we're going to dive in to our talk this morning. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we're so thankful for your goodness and your mercy. We're thankful for the breath of life that you have given to each of us. And Lord, we're thankful for this time that we have to come together and reflect upon your word and reflect upon your goodness in my life. And may Jesus be lifted up, may I become invisible, and may be Jesus be clearly seen, Father. We pray in Jesus' name. Let us all say, Amen. Amen. Okay, so we're going to look at our uh, talk today in relation to uh, what I have entitled, The Fight. And uh, when we consider the fight, then we need to know how my fight started and how I was involved in different things in my life. Uh, but, but before I do that, I want to tell you about a verse that is very important. And this verse is going to set the stage for what we are looking at. And um, I want to make sure that they get the right verse up on this screen right here so we can see it. It's uh, not showing up where it needs to be on this monitor, but I see it down here. So I don't know. I don't know, guys. And then this monitor up here isn't on. Um, so I'll read it from down here. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8. It says, finally, this is the Apostle Paul talking. He says, finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the uh, righteous judge, will give to me on that day. So the Apostle Paul is telling us that there is something important, something important that we all need to realize, and that if we could know what is ultimate success, what's ultimate success at the end of the day, at the end of our lives, it is the fact that there is a crown, there is a crown for us, there's a crown for you, there's a crown for me, and Jesus is the one that will give us that crown. And he goes on to say in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8, he says, there we go, um, finally, he says, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And he says, and not to me only, notice he says not to me only, but he says to who else? He says, to all who have loved his appearing. So that's talking about you and I today. You and I who are looking forward to the day when the clouds burst open and Jesus will come back. He's talking about us today. There is a crown for us. We can be included in this. But here's the thing. Go with me in your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 7 and notice what Paul says. As he's counseling young Timothy, he tells him, I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. So when we understand what Paul is saying, Paul is saying that the Christian experience, and you guys need to understand this, it is a fight, it is a battle, it is a lifelong journey, it's a daily experience when we look at the sanctuary as a teaching model, the sanctuary has many articles of furniture in it where a word is associated with these articles of furniture, and that word is tamid, which means daily, continual. And that's how our experience should be with God. And there are going to be good days, there are going to be bad days, there are going to be challenges ahead. So you might be wondering, and I thought I would tell you real quick before I tell you what happened after my baptism, how did my fight begin? And let me tell you, after my baptism, because I was not raised in the church, after my baptism, my fight was not over. Sometimes people think, well, oh, when I'm baptized, or oh, I'm in the church, I was raised in the church, I don't have a fight because I know Jesus. But that is not true. The battle goes on until Jesus comes back. Even if you are raised in a Christian home, and even if you have been baptized, then what, basically what you're doing, I baptized a, a, a young man one time, and he said, before I baptized him, I gave him a, a time to give a testimony. He said, look, he said, here's what I'm doing when I'm getting baptized. I know this today. He said, when I'm getting baptized, I am essentially getting down on the ground and I am drawing a line on the ground and I am declaring war with the enemy. That's what he said. And that is very true when we understand the context of the great controversy. So let me tell you about my fear factor baptism. When I was a young boy, about 12 years old, a sweet lady brought me to church and they took me to a youth event, youth event uh, at someone's home, and they played a video, played a really nice video about two young people, about some of your age, young people. These young people, there was a boy and a girl. The boy was a Christian, the girl was not. And several times in the video, the boy tried to get the girl to become a Christian, and the girl never would. So the video ends with them flying off of a cliff in their vehicle, and he is driving, she is riding, 
They hit the bottom of this ravine. The car explodes and they both die. The boy then wakes up in eternal bliss in heaven. Of course, that's not theologically accurate, but that's a study for a different time. That is not what happens when you die immediately, but that's what the video portrayed. And then the, the girl wakes up. It shifts from this scene of glory, and then it shifts to this scene of torment where this girl is just screaming and, oh, she's on fire. Her whole body's on fire. And then all of a sudden she gets a little bit of relief, and then like she just goes back into these flames, and she's just screaming in agony. And then after we watch the video, then... The youth pastor asked, how many of you now want to give your lives to Jesus? Now, what do you think I did at 12 years old after seeing this horrid picture of this girl being like the human torch on fire, but it was not a good experience, I raised my hand. I wanted to get baptized. So then we go to church next Sunday, and guess what? The pastor gives an appeal to whoever would to come forward to be baptized. And he kind of gave his sermon in relation to the video and echoed some of the themes that were in the video. And fear factor was my motivation to become a Christian. So that was not a good experience for me. Fear factor religion. Because I want you to notice what the Bible says. Notice what John says in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 18. He says, there is no fear in love, but what kind of love? Perfect love casts out fear because fear has torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Now notice another passage coming from Psalm 27. Psalm 27, it says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? And then it tells us when we consider the Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 13. It says, The fear of the Lord. What is it? The fear of the Lord is to hate evil pride and arrogancy in the evil way. And the forward mouth do I hate. So here's the big point that we need to understand about fear. When we fear God, and we need to understand what the proper context of fearing God is, that really what fearing God means is you are in a loving relationship with God, and you love what He loves, and you hate what He hates. Because all the things that God hates will cause you harm, will cause you pain, will cause you suffering, and eventually will cause you death. And you know what that thing is? That thing is called sin. Sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. That's what James tells us. So God hates sin, but He loves you and I. So if we fear God, then guess what? We don't have anything to fear. Amen? You don't have to be afraid of anything if you fear God, if you revere God, if you love God and allow His Holy Spirit to come into your life to help you to love what He loves and hate what He hates. So that brings me to the sweet lady who... who, uh, encouraged me to come to church and I heard this appeal and everything she gave me and I was I was baptized from fear factor she gave me a bible she gave me my very first bible and I was excited to have this bible but let me tell you the sad news about my bible and I want you to reflect on your bible as I tell you about my first bible this first bible I still have it today it's on my bookshelf it's a red King James Version has my name on the front of it in gold letters. Daniel Hudgens, really nice, awesome gift. But that Bible still to this day is in mint condition. It's in mint condition. That's a sad, sad situation because we want to wear out our Bibles. You want your Bible to be falling apart because this is a love letter from Jesus. So never never forget, even if you're raised in the church and you understand about the Bible, you understand that it's the inspired Word of God. Never forget that it's a personal letter from God to you, for you in this life to help you to get that crown that Paul is talking of. So don't disregard this special gift that God has given each and every one of us. And if the Bible's boring, then get an audio Bible. Listen to it in a different accent. Listen to it with background noise. There's all sorts of ways where you can have the Word of God impact your life to where it's not boring, it's exciting. You can read books about the Bible, read commentaries, read what other authors write about the Bible. Of course, you need to take the seeds that uh, are bad and spit them out of your mouth just like you do when you eat a watermelon. But there's lots of good ways to where you can take what would appear to be a boring book and make it exciting. Listen to sermons about the Bible. And you will find that as time goes by, you will start to desire to get into the Word more. You will desire to read it, to hear what God has to say in it. So it's a wonderful book. But my first Bible, I completely neglected it, and I didn't want anything to do with that Bible. Notice what D.L. Moody says. D.L. Moody says, The Bible will keep you from sin, or sin will keep you from the Bible. And I agree with that. I have learned that in my experience. And I just slowly just didn't pay attention to that Bible. And I just kind of kept on going about my life. 
an, an important passage that John tells us in John 14, verse 26. Jesus says this. He says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. But here's the thing. We have to, if we're going to claim this verse, if we're going to really claim this, then notice what he says. He says, I will bring all things to your remembrance. That means that you once have put them in your memory. That means you once spent time in the Word and read it. So if we haven't read it and if we haven't been there, then God can't bring us back to that place in the Scriptures to give us a stronghold against the forces of darkness. So don't play games with the Bible and say, oh, I know the Bible, or yeah, I've heard that before, because then when the trial comes in your life, you can't pull out your sword because you haven't sharpened it in a while. You have a dull sword, and that is no match against the enemy's sword. But if you have a sharp sword, like Jesus did, any attack that the enemy called against him, Jesus said, it is written, it is written, it is written with his sword. And he beat the devil with his sword of truth. So sharpen your swords, my dear friends. Sharpen your swords. That is one of the most important things I can share with you all that I have learned from my experience from before my baptism and after my baptism. And that is to sharpen your swords. Spend time in the Word of God. It is a love letter from God to you. And there is power in this book. So now let me back up just a little bit. I told you how I was baptized, but how was I, how was I raised? I was raised... By my parents, they, they owned a seafood restaurant. My mom was the one who wanted to do this, this idea. She wanted to have a restaurant. She was a really good cook. And we had a large piece of land that was connected to a man-made lake. And my parents were always at the restaurant. And that led me to be kind of just be by myself. Whatever I wanted to do, whenever I wanted to do it, however I wanted to do it. So I would go up to the restaurant and I would come back home. And at home I would spend so much time with my babysitter. You might have had the same type of babysitter as me. My babysitter was none other than the television set. And it was in, in, in this world of the TV that I was introduced to all these different superheroes. X-Men, Batman, Spider-Man, Commando, Rambo, uh, Godzilla, Indiana Jones, you name it, Ghostbusters, any pop culture hero that you can mention, they were my heroes. And I wanted to be a hero like Wolverine. Ching, I had those claws. I could see the claws. When I, was, when I was Spider-Man, I'd run down the hallway and I'd pretend I was sticking on the wall and I would just slide down the wall. I couldn't really stick, but in my mind, I was Spider-Man. In my mind, I was a hero. I wanted to be a hero. And then there was another hero that I really liked. His name was Daniel Sun. And I didn't have to pretend that much to be Daniel son because my name was Daniel. And martial arts came to me very easy because I had watched Ninja Turtles. I had watched all these Kung Fu movies, Bruce Lee movies. I had watched all Jean-Claude Van Damme movies. If you don't know who he is, don't, don't Google it. Don't worry about it. It doesn't matter. But I'm just telling you, I had watched all these different programs to where because I had seen them so many times, it had literally changed my mind and changed my body to where I could do these moves. I actually wanted to go to Hollywood and be a martial arts star. That's how intense it was in my life. I loved martial arts. I also loved Star Wars. I loved this battle, this whole concept between uh, the battle between good and the battle between evil. I was drawn to the battle between good versus evil. I was an imitator, you might say, and I wanted to be what I was beholding. Well, let me fast forward now a few years. In the fifth grade, I meet this lovely girl on the school bus, a very pretty girl, and something was different about her, and I just knew that I was in love with her in the fifth grade already. Even though that's impossible, I didn't even know her, but I sat down beside her and I said, hey, would you be my girlfriend? We were in the same class, actually, in the fifth grade, and in the fifth grade, she said no. But I didn't give up, men. I did not give up, young boys. Wait till the time is right. Not necessarily the ninth grade, which is, I didn't give up, and I asked her again in the ninth grade, and she said yes. Who? Yeah. She said yes in the ninth grade, and then Shortly thereafter, she gave me a book. She gave me a book, and the book was called The Richest Caveman. Now, this book blew me away, and then I went to a prophecy seminar, and I learned many special truths about what the Bible actually says about things. I learned the truth about hell, for example, what I learned as a youngster, and what motivated me to get into the waters of baptism so that maybe I could stay wet and not be burned forever and ever and ever. I learned the truth of the destruction of the wicked. I learned the special truth about the Sabbath. I learned the truth of the second coming and, and the health message and all these things. And the reason why I want to tell you about this is because uh, shortly after this, now I'm just going to skip a lot of details because I want to get to after this. When I was baptized, well, I guess I should tell you, I was baptized then. 
I was rebaptized. So rebaptism is good. Some of you have been baptized when you're young, and one day you might make a decision to be rebaptized because now you know your heart is in, in, in the proper place and you're being baptized for the proper motivation. So one thing I want to let you know is to be baptized for the proper motivations. And whenever you are in that specific situation where the Holy Spirit is convicting your heart, it is okay to be rebaptized. The Bible supports that. So I was rebaptized into now the Seventh day Adventist church. And here's the point is all of these truths, they just completely turned my world upside down. I was beginning to see how the world really is and how the Bible gives us a true picture of how to understand life, how to understand death. And that is very important because it was at this time that I want to tell you the big takeaway is don't take truth for granted. Do not take the truth for granted. People that are raised in the church, young people that are raised in the church, you are given these precious gems of truth from heaven. You're given them. I had to go out and scrape them up. I had to dig them out to discover them. And the Holy Spirit had to tug at me to pull me out of darkness into God's marvelous light. But you guys have it. So that's wonderful. But don't take it for granted. Because these truths that that you know of intellectually, as I was navigating through life now, I had been baptized, I was so thankful to understand a simple truth of Ecclesiastes 9.5, which says, the living know that they shall die, but the dead know how much? The dead know nothing. We, see, we, we understand what we call the truth about the state of the dead. But for me, this was a game changer because guess what happened? My mother, while I was in the fifth grade, was diagnosed with breast cancer. So now here it is. I'm in, the, I'm in my senior year of high school. I've been baptized recently, and I'm learning all of these truths, and it's just putting life into proper perspective for me. And it is then that I discover, we get the news that my mother had developed cancer again. Her cancer had come back. This time it had come back with a greater vengeance, and it looked like it was going to take her life. But here's the thing about me, is I was selfish. I was self-motivated. I was concerned about me. I was a spoilt, rotten teenager. And even though I had given my life to Jesus, I still had a lot of growing to do. I had a lot of learning to do. I had a lot to understand about dying to self and giving my complete life over to Jesus and loving my mother and my father and being an obedient son. I was still learning all these things, and it's a process but I tell you, because my mother was slowly dying before my very eyes, and I was so self-centered that I did not even realize it. So then it comes to where I get a phone call from my grandfather, and my grandfather had told me that if you want to go and see your mother, then you better hurry up, because they had taken her to a hospital, and they were trying to treat her, they were trying to help her, but come to find out, they decided that they needed to airlift her to another hospital. And the hospital that she was currently in was one hour away from my home. And my grandfather said, look, if you want to see your mother, you need to go see her because they're about to airlift her to another hospital that's very far away. So I get in my 1996 black stepside Ford Ranger, standard, so that means you shift the gears and it has the clutch, and I got on that little highway, I live out in the country, out in the middle of nowhere, and I drove on this highway that would, would take me to this town where my mother was, and I shifted those gears like a race car driver. Wom, 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 wom. You know, I was gone. I never saw a police officer. I thankfully was never stopped by anybody. I made it to the hospital, and guys, I never will forget. I'm going to tell you again, don't take the truth for granted. Because I never will forget as I arrived at the hospital, I can still hear it in my ears to this day. I heard the sound of the helicopter. The helicopter that was about to take my mother to the other hospital. So I run into the hospital. I don't know where I'm going. I tell the nurses who I'm looking for. So they tell me to go to the ICU. I go to the ICU, and there I see all this ruckus. I see all this commotion. Come to find out as I'm walking into the room, one of the nurses stops me, and she says, Who are you? And I said, I'm her son. And then she just has this somber face. And I'm trying to figure out why she has this somber face. And she steps aside. And I look, and I never will forget, I look to my left in the room, in the ICU room. And there is my mother lying lifeless in the bed. She is dead. She had passed away. And I was so self-centered, and I was so just disconnected from everything 
that I did not realize that my mother was dying and I missed telling her goodbye. I missed holding her hand. I missed telling her that I loved her. But here's the great comfort that I took in all of it. I had peace because, not because of how good of a son I was, but I had peace with knowing what happens when someone dies. And it helped me to get through the death of my mother. And then shortly thereafter, my grandfather died. And then my grandmother died. And I was able to go through that morning with understanding what happens at death as the Bible presents it. And it was so comforting for me to realize the truth and to not think that my mother, if she wasn't a Christian, to know the possibility that she might be burning in hell currently for, and just be burning and burning and burning. My grandmother, grandfather, the same thing. It was also comforting to know that they weren't up in heaven looking down at me. Oh, hey, what's Daniel doing? What's he doing? Oh, and my mother, knowing my mother, she would be worried about me. She would be concerned about me. And the Bible says that there'll be no more pain, no more tears in heaven. So how can my mom be in heaven crying, looking over me? So it was very comforting not having any question marks when it came to what happens when someone dies. It was very comforting to know the truth about hellfire. That helped me to go through the mourning of my mother, grandmother, and grandfather. So the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Neither have they any more a reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. So now I fast forward, and a few years of college, and I asked, like I said, I asked this girl out in the fifth grade. She said no. I asked her out in the ninth grade. She said yes. Well, now we're still dating, and I asked her to marry me, and six, this was six years later, and guess what? You don't have to guess because I have it here for you. She said yes. And we have been together now for 24 years. We've been together for 24 years, and we have been married for 17 years. And my wife tells me to this day, she'll say that uh, she doesn't have a testimony. Any of you ever feel like that? You don't have a testimony? If you've been raised in the church, because you see, my wife was raised in the church. She feels like she doesn't have a testimony. Let me tell you something important about understanding testimony for a minute. You want to hear something very important about testimony? There are two types of testimony. There is what I call the, the, the exciting ones where we hear where someone was a drug addict and they come out of drugs and they have all these experiences and like, like the richest caveman, for example. We'll use Pastor Doug. That is an amazing testimony. It changed my life. It's changed millions of people's lives all over the world to hear his testimony. But not everyone has a testimony like that. So what we need to understand is that there is a testimony that I call the saving testimony, which is like showing the saving power of God, which is what would be Pastor Doug's testimony. But there's also one that I call a keeping power. The keeping power of God, where you have been raised in a Christian home. You have been shown the principles of heaven in your life. And you understand what it means to walk with Jesus. And you have never had a desire to drift away and to go see what the devil has to offer for you. You have stayed in connection with Jesus. You have experienced his keeping power. And that is just as impressive. That is just as encouraging. That is just as powerful as the saving testimony. So we have the saving testimony and we have the keeping testimony. So if you're in the keeping testimony realm, don't think that you need to step out of that and go over here and experience some sin so that you can have a saving testimony. Because then as you're in this, in this experience... You might enjoy sin a little too much, and that's how it often starts. You go out and enjoy sin for a season, but then you understand that sin is nasty, and sin leads to death, and sin has a pull. Sin has this, this taint about it. So my, my wife thinks she does not have a testimony, but my testimony is her testimony. And our testimony, as Katie said last night, very important point, is that our testimony is the testimony of Jesus in both of our lives. So don't think that you do not have a testimony. And now just in a dedication to my wife, I want to read Proverbs 31.10. It says, Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. So after I'm baptized, I'm understanding all these truths. My wife and I are married now. Everything is going great. And I have a series of mentors. So for those of you that are in the church and you have been raised in the church or you've been baptized recently and you are in connection with Jesus and you have a local church, my advice to you would be to find some mentors. Even if they're 
miles and miles away. Do it through Zoom. Do it through text. Do it through weekly phone calls. Have a mentor. Have someone that you know because the Bible says iron sharpens iron. So look at the people that you know. Look at people that you seem, that seem to have the fruit of the Spirit in their life. You know that they have a connection with God. And connect with them and talk to them. Ask them questions. Allow them to spiritually guide you, to be your spiritual big brother or your spiritual big sister. And that is very important. I had so many good mentors who would help me and encourage me. It started off like when I would come to church, they would say, hey, Daniel, why don't one of them was a pastor. He said, hey, Daniel, why don't you this morning share like a five-minute devotional thought? I thought, what? Why do that? I'm afraid to talk in front of people. And he said, well, try it out. So I did. I gave a little five-minute devotional talk. And then he said, hey, why don't you make it 10 minutes next time? So I did that. did that a couple of times. And then he said, hey, Daniel, you know, we have an opening for telling the children's story. Would you like to tell the children's story? So I told the children's story. I loved it. I love telling the children's story. I love talking to young people. So I was like, oh, this is really fun. He said, yeah, yeah, okay. He said, We're, we have an opening to teach the adult Sabbath school lesson. How would you like to do that? I thought, ooh, that's kind of scary. But yeah, I'll try it. So I tried it, I loved it, and then one day he said, Daniel, we have a, a slot open for someone to preach the sermon on Sabbath. Would you be willing to preach? I thought, ooh, I'm kind of nervous about that, but sure, I'll give it a try. So I preached my first sermon. I never will forget. I didn't look up at the people. I read every word that was on the paper. I sound monotone. It was not encouraging, but I did the best that I could, and I tried to give the glory to God. And then came time where now it's time for an evangelistic series. We could have hired an evangelist. We could have done all these things. But now I had been preaching. I had been studying. I had been binge watching. Before, there was a, before binge watching was a thing, I was binge watching Pastor Doug. I was, just, I was an Amazing Facts fan. Here I am. I'm just watching all this stuff, watching all this stuff. And I should mention that it was when I was baptized that a prophecy seminar came into our town, and it was an Amazing Facts evangelist. Right after I finished reading The Richest Cave Man, a prophecy seminar came to my town from Amazing Facts, and I was baptized, and I thought to myself, back then a seed was planted in my heart that I wanted to do that. I wanted to be an Amazing Facts evangelist. I wanted to share the truths of God's Word with people to help them to have the experience that I had. So here it is that they could have, they could have contacted anybody. But they said, hey, my mentors, they said, let's get Daniel to preach the evangelistic series. Whew, you talk about butterflies, you talk about nerves now. I was so scared. But what did I do? I went home, I started working on my slides, I started watching, binge watching again, Pastor Doug. I would watch his sermon on the topic that I was going to present on, and I would try to memorize everything he said. I would try to memorize every story that he told, and I would just write it down, write it down, and then I would practice and practice and practice. I would practice before, but, but with my wife and her mother and father. I was just getting ready and getting ready, and then came time for the evangelistic series. I preached my heart out. I preached and I preached and I preached, and I was sharing these precious truths from the Bible, and guess how many people were baptized? Tell me. Zero. Zero people were baptized. I was devastated. But I had this realization, you see, because in this prophecy seminar, I had to teach the 70 weeks of Bible prophecy. I had to teach the 12, the 1,260 days. I had to teach the 2,300 days. I had to properly help people to understand what happens at death, what, what happens in the experience of the destruction of the wicked, how to properly understand the second coming of Jesus. All these different things, who the Antichrist is, how to explain it from the Bible. I See, it's one thing to hear the truth and embrace it and say, yeah, that's, that's right, that sounds good. I can hear the facts and those sound good. They sound rather amazing, no pun intended. But yes, the facts are amazing. But here's the thing. It's a whole nother thing. It's a whole nother ball game when you have to take all that information that you accept and that sounds good and logically makes sense, but then to go out and share it yourself and help someone else have those same takeaways, it's a whole other experience. So what I realized at the end of this evangelistic series was this evangelistic series was not for all the other people. I was essentially preaching to myself. The evangelistic series was for me, and what it did was it lit a fire within me that... Thankfully, and praise God, has never seemed to grow dim. I love to talk about the Bible. I love to communicate God's Word to people. I love to sit down one-on-one -on -one and help someone understand and connect the dots. 
that's what's found in the Bible. I love to give Bible studies with people, and I love to preach the Word of God. And what this caused me to do was what Paul counseled Timothy to do. He said, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. So let me just tell you real quick. Never, never stop digging into the Word of God. There's a parable that Jesus tells about a man who finds a treasure in a field and then he goes and sells all that he has to go and get this treasure. And this treasure, whether you realize it or not, is actually a treasure mine. It's like a gold mine. It's not just a buried treasure. It's a mine of treasure. A never-ending supply of treasure. And what this is symbolizing for us is the very Word of God. The Word of God is a treasure house that you can never exhaust. It's a well that never runs dry and you never find the bottom and it will feed you until the day that you die. Job said, I have esteemed thy word more than my necessary food. Think of the word of God as your food and study it. That means to dig deep and go through it from page to page, chapter to chapter, book by book and and understand what it's writing. Why? So that you are not ashamed. This is a big thing when you're a young person. We don't want to stand out. We don't want to have an unpopular message. And, and sometimes it's difficult to share the truth because then you're put, on, the spotlight is put on you and maybe you're going a different way with what you're saying than all the other people and it makes you feel uncomfortable. You get anxiety. Sweat pops up on your forehead. You get butterflies in your stomach. But here's the thing. The more that you study, the more that you understand the Word of God and the more that you understand how to share with people in a non-combative manner, but in a Christ-like manner, then something begins to happen and you are no longer ashamed. And let me just tell you, there is nothing to be ashamed of to be a Seventh-day Adventist. Can you say amen? There is nothing to be ashamed about being a Seventh-day Adventist Bible Christian. There's nothing to be ashamed about with that. So my prayer now, as I'm... After I've done this seminar, I'm in the Valley of Decision. I'm trying to figure out, do I go to seminary? What do I do? Because I I feel this calling to preach the Word of God. Here it is. I'm about to graduate college with a degree in graphic design, but I'm still preaching. I'm going to churches. I'm taking invitations. I'm doing seminars. I'm just preaching, 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 and studying and doing all these things, and I don't know what to do with my life. I don't know which direction to go. And I prayed to God. My prayer was simple. It said, Uh, Lord, give me an ounce of the knowledge or of the wisdom of Solomon. I said, Lord, just give me a little piece of knowledge. Just give me a little piece. And I said, help me to know, Lord, do I need to to go to seminary? And and let me just say real quick, seminary, I'm not trying to bash seminary at all because there are people that I know, there are other presenters on this panel that uh, that you'll see that have went to seminary. So I'm not, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm asking God, was seminary for me? Not was seminary bad? but was seminary for me in my current walk with God. So I'm praying for an answer, trying to figure out what to do. We get a phone call that my, some of my wife's relatives, who were missionaries, uh, he had a library. He had, all, he had a, he, a big library with all these theological books, all these books from seminary, all these things. And he called and said, hey, we know Daniel is starting to preach a whole lot and he's starting to study. Would Daniel like, notice notice the language that was used, would Daniel like a few books? And I said, sure. And I'm thinking, I don't know about you, but when I hear a few books, I'm thinking like a handful of books. So so they said a few books, so we said yes. So a couple of days later, a UPS truck pulls up and literally there is a huge stack of boxes. I open up the boxes, they're filled with books, books from seminary. So I'm thinking, whoa, what is this? Seminary is coming to my house. So then I open up all the books. I'm looking at them. A couple of days later, another knock on the door. It's it's the UPS man, whole another big stack of boxes. This happened several days in a row. And now if any of you have ever done AFCO online, you see behind me all these books, all of those books, 90% of those books came free of charge by this man who sent all these, he was getting ready to retire, and he just emptied out his library, some of his library, and gave it to me. So what I took that as, is an answer of God saying, here's your wisdom, and here's your seminary. Keep doing what you're doing. So I did. I kept reading those books. I kept preaching. I kept teaching. 
And let me tell you about some of the avenues that I went through that I hope you don't go through, but I, was, I got very involved in conspiracy theories. I was all into conspiracy theories. And I was all into who the Jesuits are. Who's a Jesuit? I became a Jesuit hunter. If you don't know what a Jesuit is, don't worry about it right now. Focus not on the Jesuits, but focus on Jesus. Don't fo focus on conspiracy theories, but focus on Christ. And then don't have a critical spirit where you're, you're looking at other people and you're thinking, oh, I eat this way. Look at how they're eating. Oh, I'm reading these books. They're reading these other books over here. I'm not watching these programs, but they're watching these programs. And before you know it, you become like a Pharisee. And you become like, you think that you're better than other people. And you have this critical spirit. But, it, but what we need, we don't need a critical spirit. We need the Holy Spirit. When you have the Holy Spirit, then you can help people. And instead of seeing that, in my mind, everything was evil. It was just evil. Evil, evil, evil. And I, I became to where my faith was not attractive. And it caused tension between my wife and I because I was going a little extreme in certain areas of my life. Now, I'm not talking about standing firm and, and being connected to Jesus and standing for Him like the three Hebrew worthies in Daniel chapter 3. But don't take it too far. You need to have balance. It makes me think of when I was in an open tournament in Taekwondo when I was a young boy. I, I had this open tournament where an open tournament is where Kung Fu can come, Tang Sudu can come, Muay Thai can come, whatever style, it's open for all styles. And I was invited to come to this open tournament. I did not want to go, but my, my sensei encouraged me to go. And I went and I was scared to death. Because I didn't want to fight all these guys, all these different styles. I figured they could wax the floor, wax me, wax the floor with me. So what happened is, we get up there. My first match, I fight a kung fu guy, and I had this trick that I did. I would do a. I'm not going to do it right now because I'll rip my. I might rip my uh, suit uh, pants, and that would be very embarrassing. So I'm not going to do it. But I would do a front kick. I would do a front kick. And I would do it about three times, and they would block the front kick, block the front kick, block the front kick. And then I would switch it over to a round kick. And they thought I was going to do a front kick again because I had done it a few times, and I would get them every time with the round kick. Lightning fast, just pow, in the head. And that's, that's two points. And then one time I did it with a jump round kick, and that's three points. So I beat the kung fu guy. He didn't, he didn't hit me one time. I fought the next guy. I beat him the same exact way. I didn't get hit one time. The next guy, I beat him, and I did not get hit a single time. I made it through that match, not getting hit a single time through that tournament, and I won the six-foot trophy. Now, why do I tell you that story? The reason is, the, how I defeated those guys was I had good balance. In order to do the kick that I was doing, you had to have good balance. And you guys need to understand, if you're going to win the victory, if you're going to stay connected to Jesus and have all these voices of Adventism coming to you, because that's one thing that was confusing to me, is when I joined the Adventist church, I thought, wow, I finally joined the truth. All these dear brothers and sisters, they're all on the same page. They're all from all over the world, and they are marching into heaven. But then when I entered into the church, I realized that the church is filled with a bunch of people, a bunch of people that need a Savior. And they're having some different theological views and having different motives and things. And it was very difficult to get through that. But it helped me to understand one principle is we need to be balanced. Not too far over here on the right. Not too far over here on the left. Keep your eyes on Jesus and he will guide you every step of the way. And don't listen to the other voices that you might have. I remember I was, had a speaking engagement and, and I went to this place, and I was getting ready to speak, and there was an old lady. An old lady. You got to watch out for these old people. I love the old people, but you got to watch out for some of them. And they came up to me. So old people, you listen to this. The old, this old lady came up to me, and she said, What's your name? I told her my name, and she said, Well, have, have, are you ordained? And I said, Well, no, ma'am. And she said, Have you been to seminary? And she was just grilling me, asking me all these questions, and I felt beat down. I didn't feel like I was worthy to be able to present the Word of God, which now I know nobody's worthy. We're all just humps of, of clay, of dust, but, but it, it hurt my feelings. So here's the point. There are going to be people that hurt your feelings, but here's what happened. The Lord has a sense of humor. I love God so much. As this lady is grilling me, making me feel this little, as I'm about to preach, mind you, we're talking like two minutes before I preach. 
all of a sudden we hear this very, very unchristlike rap song starts playing. I'm not going to give repeat it to you, but it was it was something you would not want to hear rap song. And come to find out what it was, she's oh oh oh, oh. and it, she had her cell phone, and her her ringtone was this ridiculous rap song. It was very unchristlike, and the whole church heard it. And now everybody transitions from looking at me, seeing how unworthy I am, this unordained, non-seminary preacher who doesn't know anything, and now everyone is looking at this lady who has a rap song blaring coming out of her cell phone, little old granny with a rap song. And I thought, thank you, Lord. Thank you for delivering me from this trial and giving me a triumph. Can you say amen? So that was very funny for me, and... uh, there's just so many things I could share with you, but, but let me just fast forward. I'm going to fast forward to a, a billion slides here. I move, I accept a position at Amazing Facts, and now I have the privilege of traveling all over, preaching to people from all, all over the world, interacting with youth, and I don't deserve it, training in the AFCO department, teaching these people the, the Word of God, and it is such a privilege and an honor to be able to do it. Now let me leave you with one thing. Mark chapter 14 and verse 72, immediately the rooster crowed the second time. And then Peter remembered the, the word that Jesus had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. And he broke down and wept. You see, Peter, Peter was a chicken. And the rooster was more faithful than Peter. But the story doesn't end there. And Peter, who was a chicken, becomes a rooster for God. And he said in the book of Acts, we cannot help but speak the things that we have seen and heard dealing with the testimony. So some of you in this room today, you might find yourselves ashamed because of the truth that you know. You've taken for granted the truth that you know. And you might sometimes be a chicken. But I hope that you will echo this appeal. This is your appeal. That you will pray, Lord, I know sometimes I'm a chicken. But Lord, I want to be your rooster too. So help me learn my cock a doo So when you know what God has for you, you can faithfully be the rooster. The rooster has an unpopular message. The rooster rises early in the morning and you can depend on the rooster. So we need more roosters and less chickens. If you want to be a rooster for Jesus, raise your hand. And let's have prayer together. Lord, we thank you so much for your goodness. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for the saving power of the testimony and the keeping power of the testimony, Lord. May Jesus be lifted up in this conference. May we continue to hear from him. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.